So I'm uh, Natalie Stickle, and I work uh, at UHN in the bioinformatics and HPC core there, and for HPC for Health as well. Um, my, I started work in the research aspect of genomics, but have since been prim become primarily responsible for moving our pipelines into the clinical space. We process all of the clinical data for Toronto General Hospitals Labs and Princess Margaret uh, Cancer Centre as well. So the learning objectives of the module are to gain some insight into the complexity of clinical accreditation, to help you understand how the goals differ for research versus clinical testing, and to um, appreciate the importance of validation, which has already been mentioned, uh, and for, but, but also validation for infrastructure as well as software and your results. Um, we want to understand some of the problems and pitfalls of a panel-based genetic test being used as a clinical test, and also some insight into the complexities of incorporating your next generation sequencing data into an e-health record. So this slide is to demonstrate sort of that complexity. Um, when you're dealing with clinical bioinformatics, really it's more than just processing the data from a panel, um, which is sort of primarily what research, you process it, you do some annotation perhaps and pass it off. Um, on the clinical side, at least in our experience, it's really um, that, but also the standardization of that process in all aspects. Your pipeline, how you label things, how you interact with the lab has to also be standard. Um, and then where you store and archive that data and how that data is archived, how you can, you know, pull it out of the archive, all has to be very standard and documented. Um, also, of course, privacy and security are at the forefront of any uh, clinical data. And so same with, with next generation sequencing results. And then there's a communication aspect. You're working with a clinical lab, there's a lot of time constraints, so you need to really streamline and uh, document the way that you're going to <coughs> communicate between them so that you don't waste time um, in that aspect. Hold them up. For research, the primary goal would usually be discovery. You're often looking for things that are unknown, it's exploratory. You're still interested, of course, in reproducibility and sample quality of cost. But it's different from the clinical, uh, you know, standard of care primarily is even more different in that you're really looking for things that are actionable only. So when you do the annotation, you can focus in or they want to focus in on things that have either, um, if it's a clinical trial, something that has a clinical trial, either a drug that is known to, to be actionable on that variant or also things that are known to have prognostic value. Um, there's lots of standards that are involved in both the clinical trial labs and clinical standard of care labs. They're both uh, CAP, CLIA, and OLA. Those are the main requirements. Uh, we'll talk about those in the next slide. That covers things like validation, again, of the infrastructure, of your software, of your results. Um, also, it dictates how you have to version and track your pipeline pieces of software and your SOPs. Um, there has to be an audit trail on all actions and interactions with that data. Um, and quality control of the samples and how you can try to determine was there a sample swap, are you following those samples through the process um, from the beginning to the end and you know that you have the same, the same sample and the same data. Uh, it's also really different from research in the way of thinking. So when you're interacting with the lab and with the clinicians, uh, they're used to dealing generally with more standard black and white lab results. Most other standard labs that test that are incorporated in clinical labs and are used in standard of care have much more defined boundaries and are less fuzzy in their result than you've even seen today how fuzzy you know, next generation sequencing data can be. And that can be difficult and you have to communicate that back to the lab and the clinicians as part of the process of using one of these tests in standard of care particularly. Also, they often choose smaller panels of genes versus whole exome or whole genome sequencing. Partly that's cost related. You know, a lot of these tests are funded by the government and only funded for certain genes. They may be running a 50 p p uh, gene panel, but only reporting on 20 of those genes because those are what the Ministry of Health will cover cost wise. Um, and so you wouldn't want to run an exome or whole genome and then only report on five or 10 or 20 of those genes. But also they don't want to find incidental findings. So if you are trying to report on a certain number of genes, but you run a whole exome and you find some other variant in the gene outside of your scope, 
that is possibly causative of some other disease, do you report that to the patient or not? And there's a lot of guidance that's out there about that, but it's still a bit of a difficult uh, situation, so they would rather not see those at all. So for accreditation, the main, um, the main regulatory uh, bodies are CAP and CLIA in the States. So if you want to process and deal with samples that uh, originate in the United States, even if we're in Canada, you need to have the CAP and CLIA standards and accreditation and requirements in place. Um, in Ontario, we also have OLA, the Ontario Laboratory Accreditation, which um, is also related to the Institute for Quality Management in Healthcare. And it's basically a lot of the requirements and standards for all of these are very similar. So if you're meeting the CAP and CLIA requirements, you're most likely meeting the OLA and Institute of Quality Management, but you may have to report it or document it in a slightly different way. So the basics of accreditation in terms of what, as a bioinformatician, we have to worry about are really the documentation. Everything has to be documented in a clear format, standard formats, and that that then gets signed and dated by the laboratory director. And those things happen, both the validation and any other documents that are related to the data um, processing. That all has to be in place before the panel can be used and they can sign off and sign out uh, results as part of the clinical, yes? Senator Does here. it still have to be paper, or is there electronically, electronically, electronically signed uh, documents that are also legal and valid? Yeah, um, I think that they, they do have, in our labs anyway, they do have the paper signed, um, but they don't have, you, okay, we have more than one lab location, and they have a paper copy in one location, and they've decided that electronic copies are acceptable for other locations, because really they're supposed to be present in all in the labs, doesn't matter that they're sort of under the same director. Um, so they have not gone to fully electronic, but I think that that could happen in the future. It's probably acceptable. I'm not sure uh, on that, honestly. Um, but right now, they are very much in the paper with, a, with one signed copy at the, at the hospital in general. Um, so because these documents have to be available for an inspector, when they come. So they usually come in a prescribed time frame. It's not a total random show up one day, completely unexpected. Usually it's a, a set standard um, uh, frequency. And so you'll get a, a time frame when they'll show up and, and the documentation does need to be there to show them. And generally they like to sit there and flip through the binders. <laughs> so um, that's how it has been in the past, but I think it probably will we'll move to more electronic as we go forward. Um, they also, you know, can spot, we need to spot test the pipelines using data that is sent by these accreditation bodies. So they will send FASTQ files and run it through the pipeline and can then send the results back in a blinded way. We don't know what the results are supposed to be. And you'll get a report back later. And this is done across many um, labs with the same set of data. And then you get a report back saying, well, most people found these variants or, you know, you get to see sort of what, where you stand in the, in the process. So they'll do it for a particular panel, yes. So they won't, you can't, exactly, it's not going to test. We have not gone through this process for all of the panels that we have validated. It has been sent, they have sent for one standard panel, like for a, a commercially available panel, not a custom gene panel. Okay. So if you're using that commercially available panel, then you would participate in this analysis. Um, and that does leave a lot of caveats. For example, many of, well, in so far in the time I've been here, the ones that they have used as these tests have all been Amplicon-based panels. So if you're not testing a different method, like hybrid capture, you know, how, how our pipeline is, is quite different for those two. So there are, you know, it's, it's, only, a, it's only a litmus test. It's not the uh, final answer there. Um, so the documentation, for bioinformatics only, includes validation documentation for all the panels that you have. Um, again, if you're using a hybrid capture panel and you have multiple gene sets, but they're all based on the same technology, it's actually acceptable to use sort of a combination of data from all of those when they're the same technology, just different sets of genes. You can combine all of that together on one validation to increase the power. If you have a small set of genes in one panel, 
and another panel with another set of genes, using all of that data and all those variants together is more powerful and they understand that given that the technology is the same across those, your, your results are, are going to be consistent and uh, does give more power to the validation. Um, you need to document the pipeline details, how, which software we're using, what uh, versions, uh, what commands exactly, where we downloaded the files to use for the reference genome or dbSNP or anything else. All of those things have to be locked down. As was stated before, you can't use the latest version necessarily without doing a whole lot of work again. Um, so you, you choose one, you lock it down, and you stick with exactly that for until you, until you revalidate. Also, the procedure for updating the panel or our pipeline, <coughs> as I'm sort of alluding to, would have to be documented as well. So yes, you have to lock it down and use only one version, but of course you will want to upgrade at some point. You will want to update. Maybe there's a bug in one of the versions of software you're using. So you need to have a procedure in place to be monitoring that and to um, implement the up update if necessary. We also have standard operating procedures. So for someone to run the pipeline and to process the results, they have to follow that document exactly. Um, and as such, we have an exception log. If something happens, as it does occasionally, where something's wrong with the files or something goes wrong while you're processing, you have to document what happened, what the change was, and what you did about it. <laughs> We also have a data security policy, which stipulates how we're protecting the data, how we audit our uh, storage and archival and retrieval process and all that. So part of our pop pipeline documentation is uh, when, so for us, it's a custom built analysis pipeline. So we have written a full manual that details all of the document, uh, all of the steps all of the commands involved, what the expected result would be, what kinds of files go in, what file, kinds of files come out, where you might see uh, variants falling out in that process because of certain restrictions we have in the variant caller, mapping quality or base quality or so on. All of that is documented um, in this document and it's at about 50 pages at the moment. So it's quite extensive. Um, then we also have each step in the pipeline right to a log file with a timestamp. And we can use those files to error check for, you know, we are using a cluster, we're submitting multiple jobs across the cluster, and sometimes a node will fail, and some of the jobs will then not be completed, not processed properly. Well, when you're launching thousands of jobs at a time, how can you tell that? When it writes the exit status back to these files, then we can, you know, check that at the end. Does it match the number of jobs you submitted to the number of jobs that finished um, successfully, or, or were there some failed jobs? <clears throat> So this is a little excerpt of the standard operating procedures. Again, it covers, has a purpose, scope, the required components you would need to run the pipeline. Um, it, just, it has definitions and then a very detailed outlining of all the procedure and all the steps you would have to do in order to execute the pipeline. Now, our pipeline, I would say most pipelines that you'll be running, if you're doing a standard thing in the clinical lab anyway, especially, you will have um, maybe one or two commands you will launch and they will then proceed to run a whole bunch of subsequent steps in them. So the document really is defining how did we get the data, how are we alerted to get the data from the lab in the first place, what information do they send to us, how do we process that data, in a, the little excerpt there is a pipeline requisition form, where they have to tell us what panel they ran, what is the sample a normal sample or a tumor sample, is it processed on, uh, which version of the chemistry did they use, all this kind of information that you need in order to, when they're running multiple different panels, as they do, you know, how do we go about which steps in the pipeline do we need to use, which some commands will be slightly different depending on the panel. So another thing to consider when you're um, setting out to set up a pipeline is, and to validate it, is how to set out your workflow. So if, it, as an example, you have a tumor sample and a normal sample and you're interested in somatic variants, you might also be interested in germline variants in the same set of, uh, in the same patient. One way that you can look for somatic variants is to run the tumor and normal um, samples in, I don't know how to actually use the pointer there, but on the left side, you can see if you run the tumor and the normal uh, together, they process together, which gives more power to the steps of uh, indel realignment and, um, and so you process the samples as, they're, as if they're one sample at that point in those uh, recalibration, base recalibration and indel realignment steps. 
but then you can use a somatic variant collar where it takes, again, information from the tumor and the normal together and will output only calls that it considers to be somatic. Um, so that's on the left. On the right, you could also alternately process your tumor and your normal more separately and end up with variant calls for each individually and then sort of do some kind of subtraction for the, the blood and the tumor. That's what they, the clinical lab was mostly doing it as is just depicted on the right side um, before we took over the pipeline and sort of worked on it with them. Um, and there's caveats to both, I would say. You get more power from processing the samples together as one. It's true. But in each case, you can potentially miss some variants in either the germline or the somatic category. This slide sort of tries to show that. So when you filter a, a blood sample, the calls, the variant calls from a blood sample looking for germline variants, um, they'll have some kind of filter for frequency. In our lab, it's 20%. It's generally considered, uh, if it's above 20%, then that's likely to be, that's considered a, a germline variant. So uh, then if you process the blood and tumor together for somatic calling, if you, let's say you had a variant that was present in your blood sample at 5 or 10 or 15 percent, it would not then output that variant in the tumor as a uh, somatic call because it's saying, no, it's present in the blood. It's present in both samples. By the, the somatic variant caller would see it in both samples and say, no, that's a germline call. But in your germline data, you would have filtered it out as not being a germline call based on the frequency you're using as your cutoff for calling something a germline call. So if you didn't consider that and do something else, then you would potentially lose, maybe it's a BRCA call, uh, variant that has actionability, whether it's germline or, or somatic, you would miss that call. So in our case, we also then process the tumor separately and you have to kind of go back and look, well, did I see anything in the tumor? If I only look at it alone, yeah. So there's a lot of steps involved. Um, and mostly now we've moved away from using the normal and tumor together um, just because of these caveats and also for cost. So also documentation of the workflow and the data flow. So this is describing an, an image from one of our documents on how the data moves through our systems. From the sequencer, it gets processed, uh, written directly rather, to uh, one of our clusters and then it gets moved and processed in various different locations. So all of that is documented and described in more detail in, in the documents that are on file with the clinical labs. <coughs> um, but basically, it also um, is depicting the way that the data is archived and backed up at what frequency, depending on which state it's at. Your raw data files are really small, and to um, you need to sync them nightly. We do that at first, but you wouldn't want to continue to do that all the time in order to make a backup of them. They're not changing. And so once we're finished with the processing, we tar them up and move them over to a more permanent archive where we don't have to move all those files back and forth all the time. So things like that, um, they, make, they make perfect sense, but you need to sort of say, well, this is the standard way we're going to do it and why. All of that's written down. So when you go to validate the panel, um, there's lots of different places that you can get data in order to calculate your sensitivity and specificity and to determine if the methods you're using for variant calling are the best ones, as was described earlier, with the false positives and false negatives. So uh, this picture sort of shows mm, probably all of, or most of the different uh, ways that you can get data for these calculations. You can use data from this generated inside, inside the lab. We often use, um, if they have another test they've been using, then we'll pull all of those variants in that they've calculated from or found from using a PCR-based test or from using Sanger sequencing, what they've done in the past time. We'll pull out the samples that have no invariants from those techniques and run those on the new panel, the NGS panel, and then see how many do we call of those. And that's a good true positive, false positive. Um, false negative uh, way to calculate. We also use the data from the Coriel cell line that he was showing before, the NA12878. That's a very standard cell line. has a lot of well-defined variants in it. Um, one problem we have sometimes is that if you're using a smaller gene panel, then there's a very limited number of high-quality variants in that data set on just those small number of genes. 
but as I sort of said before, you can use an, a larger panel that's of the same technology and that can increase your, um, the numbers in your validation by doing that. Um, also, there's another cell line that has a lot of data as well, the NA19240, similar to that, the other one, but mm, a, lot less, a lot less high quality data. But with th both of those cell lines, it's still a problem that they have a certain set of variants that are defined as high quality. You can be confident in those. So if you call those, you can say, yes, I did a good job at calling those. But you'll for sure call other variants outside of those. Some of them might match up with their low quality data set, which they provide, but some of them won't. And you'll call maybe some that aren't in that set and some in the set you won't call. And how do you know which ones are positive, false positives and which ones are false negatives? And it, it becomes very difficult very quickly to do a full cal calculation. Again, the true positives, it's not so hard to find those, and to call those. Um, so other things that you can do are to use um, in silico data sets. We can take data, even often we've taken data that we've generated from a particular panel and spike in variants or copy number or whatever changes into, the, into that BAM file and then use that to test your caller. There's also caveats to that because there's errors that are introduced by the software itself. So again, not a perfect uh, system either, but if you use all of these tools together, all of the different data sets together that you can gather, all the pieces of information together end up being a pretty solid set of data that you can then come up with a pretty good sensitivity specificity uh, result for your documentation. But if you use, tried to use just one or two of these, you would find there's a lot of holes. So things to consider for clinical uh, NGS testing would be the design of the panel. Often, I mean, just what is the goal in the first place? Are they going to be running samples that are blood or tumor, solid tumor versus um, uh, myeloma? They, they need different gene sets, but they also need um, potentially uh, a different panel, or, or you could use a different panel. For um, a lot of the leukemias, they have a very defined set of variants that they're interested in and that are actionable. So traditionally, they would, could use a more, um, a smaller amplicon-based panel and look specifically for only those variants because that's all they're interested in. So if that's what they're, they're really only going to report on five or 10 different genes and only about, you know, 20 variants within those, then maybe that's a good way to go. The cost is lower and you have a lot less work to do with your validation. So those are, are good things. Um, but if they're interested in uh, profiling solid tumors or other things that are much more unknown or there could be more clinical trials in the future, adding more um, actionable genes in as you go, then a larger panel will take you longer to validate but might actually be more useful in the end. <clears throat> also, are they interested in germline or somatic or both, and, uh, and, and what cost? I mean, is it something covered by the Ministry of Health? There's, there's definitely um, an aspect of cost then. <clears throat> um, also, with validation, what's the gold standard? So we talked about using data from other tests in the lab to become the false positives, or sorry, true positives and true negatives for the validation of an NGS test. But those other methods have other problems themselves. The um, sensitivity of Sanger is much lower than the sensitivity in NGS. So how do you then, if we're looking at variants in a tumor that we want to be able to call down to five or even less percent, uh, there's not really a good way to check those with Sanger. So we also need to understand the different parameters of the algorithms that we're using and how um, changing those might have changed our result and why, why did we make those changes? Our method has always been to start with the default of the caller and then to change certain things in order to improve our sensitivity and specificity and then document why did we make that change. So there's many callers, many of these variant callers we've been talking about or even the um, GATK when you're processing the BAM, they have a million different arguments that you could use. You could tweak a million different things. How do you know which one to do? So you, you really can't. You can't change them all. You can't effectively test them all. We don't have a good enough known data set to be able to uh, just run through all the different possibilities and figure out programmatically which is the right one, which would be ideal. Um, so all you can do is start with what is the recommended 
generally used settings and then see what happens to your data if you manipulate a few that make some sense when you read what they're about. So I would also just add that large panels are really complex to validate. I think I kind of said that before. And when we uh, validated the largest one so far is a 555 uh, gene panel. And that document is like almost 300 pages long. So you know, it gets to be a little bit unwieldy. With that panel, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the validation and some of the issues that came up. These uh, were, are genes that are related to cancer and they're intended for screening cancer patients for um, clinical trials, generally. So to validate this panel, we used a smaller panel that had been previously used in the lab. It's the TrueSeq Amplicon Cancer Panel. So it's an Amplicon-based panel and only 48 genes. That's not a really great comparator to a hybrid capsule capture panel of 555 genes. So we had to think of another way. There'd be far too many holes in that data for us to really be confident in our validation using only that known set, even if we added in the Coriel cell line, the 12878. I believe there's about 600 variants um, in the high quality data set within the regions of this panel that we're validating. It's a pretty good number, but when you're talking about that many bases that we want to call variants on, it's actually kind of a small number. So as a way to add in some more data, we used another panel, the Comprehensive Cancer Panel, CCP, which is 409 genes. And that's run on the ion torrent technology, so totally different technology from, from the Illumina system, which was, uh, sorry, which was done on purpose in order to be confident in anything that is called by the two methods together, but added a lot of complexity in what was correct when, when they disagreed. We did also try some synthetic data, but again, like I mentioned before, these tools that you can use to manipulate the files have a lot of errors and problems in themselves. So it's something you can try, and I think that these tools will probably continue to improve. Um, but at the time, this was several years ago, it was, it was kind of a uh, uh, frustrating process to, to get them to work. They've just added errors of their own. So another thing to think about related to this validation would be how do you compare variants, particularly between the two technologies. When you're talking about an Amplicon um, base panel versus a hybrid capture panel, there's a lot of issues. And then when you're talking about using MySeq Reporter versus the GATK methods, they don't all even call the same variants the same way. For example, you can have different justifications of a variant. So if we're talking about the reference being CAG with the A being the deletion, you can report that in those three different ways. They're both the same. They have the same meaning, but you can't easily compare those, especially when you're trying to do it over many samples and that many genes. We wanted to make a, a programmatic way to compare the VCF files. If you don't first correct for this kind of issue, you won't be able to do that effectively. So, as a result, if you don't do that effectively, or even if you do, you can get really stuck in these weird, as you know, lost in the weeds is the way of saying it, the weird areas of, of these aligners, of these two different systems. So the same sequence, the same sample run on the Illumina panel versus on the uh, ion torrent um, <laughs> method. And, you know, the Illumina clearly calls it as a deletion of all of those bases, whereas on the iron torrent, yeah, it's, it probably still is a deletion, but when you see it in a VCF, it gives you a series of, of, of SNVs. How do you possibly, you can't really normalize that out and to do, enable to um, be able to compare these VCFs just by a program. When you look at it, you can see what's happening and it makes sense, but it's difficult to do it more automatedly, which is what you would want to do. Another issue is that there's lots of artifacts in sequencing generally, especially when you get into larger panels. So one thing that we did was try to plot them all to see, well, which ones, this is all the variants of the panel for over 100 samples. Um, and this is variants that were called in our comprehensive cancer panel um, for this validation. So we know that the ion torrent system in general calls more uh, artifacts, especially around homopolymers and so on. So we're like, well, how can we find these and pull them out without having to sift through it all um, by hand? So plotting them, we've plotted the percent frequency uh, on the x-axis and, sorry, 
the frequency is on the y-axis and the number of times it was called is on the x-axis. So anything that is at the bottom, uh, sorry, the right-hand bottom would be called in almost every sample at a really low frequency. Same thing, top, uh, top right is everything in every sample at 100%. Uh, you can see the pattern that comes right through the middle is, is as you would expect. You expect things in, you know, there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of variants that are real at 50% and at 100%, okay? And so, you know, we're not so interested in things like that. Those are variants that are common in the population and we want to filter those out as well. Um, another thing is, we're like, well, what happens if you look at indels versus SNBs? So they're colored differently here. The um, SNBs are in pink and the indels are in green. And so, you know, how, how does this help us try to determine which of these pockets on this plot are the, are the artifacts? If we wanted to just pull out variants from this data and make a list of them that we would filter out of all our data later on, which was our goal, um, how do we know exactly where to put the lines to cut off? And does it matter if it's an indel? It, it does, um, but I'm not sure where we got from that. So the next step we did was to remove things that are very common in the population. So you see that line at 50% leaves, all the ones right across the top at 100% leaves, so that, that helps a lot. Really, in the end, the bottom right hand, and perhaps somewhere up the top, uh, uh, moving upwards from there, when those variants that are present in all or most of the samples are at a low frequency, those are artifacts, most likely. Where to put the cutoff of the frequency is the question, and we don't, I don't have an answer for that. Um, this is something that we're still working on, actually. How do you determine a, a real artifact list programmatically? In our lab, the variant annotators make their own list as they go. <laughs> so we're trying to help them with that because that's very time consuming when you're talking about a large panel. Uh, now I'll talk a bit about some other pitfalls of the variant callers that are important for validating your clinical panel. Um, no variant caller is perfect. Um, some of them have more filters and are more stringent, but you're more likely to miss a real variant. If they have more relaxed criteria, well, then you might call something that is real, but how do you go back and figure out, you know, was it real and can I report it out as a clinician? Um, one of the major problems we've come across is that many callers will only call one variant per genomic location. Um, this is good in a way that it helps you remove some false positives. If there's a spot where there's a few of uh, one change and many of another, it won't call two variants in that position and that would cause you problems to, to eliminate that. Um, but it is uh, problematic as we'll see here. So if there's two variants at the same position, there's two possibilities. One, that both variants are real. It could be clonal variation from a tumor. Um, but the other possibility is that one variant is real and the other is an artifact due to some kind of homologous region or a sequencing error or something else. So this is an example where we, and we don't know, I don't know which is the answer here. Um, there's a SNP and then there is an indel right after it. And it's not a particularly repetitive region, um, but, well, there is a little bit of repetitiveness there, so I don't know. Is it, is it the SNP? Is it the indel? I actually don't know the answer in this case, um, but the SNP is at about 16%. The indel was at a higher percentage, I forget exactly, and all of our variant callers reported the insertion. I believe one of the four that we use called the SNP as well. But it's there. It actually has a high population frequency, so it's probably a real variant, or it could be in some other case, and does there, is there also an insertion there? Well, I, I don't know. And so this was actually something that one of the lab technicians called me up and wanted me to look at because our, our BCF that we provided them only had the insertion. But when she goes to review it in IGB, as they do, she's like, well, why isn't the SNP there now? And she says, in this case, it doesn't matter because it's a population variant. We're okay with that. But, you know, they're very concerned about, well, what would happen if in a similar case in some other location where it's actually an important variant? Um, another issue is complex variants that can be sometimes reported by variant callers as multiple variants on separate lines, but they're close together. Are they really a more complex variant? So here are two deletions that are only separated by three bases. It's most likely uh, a much larger uh, insertion deletion, a whole deletion of a larger region with a little bit of an insertion put back. There's not really any way to 
fix this programmatically. I mean, some variant callers do a better job at making a combined call of a, a region like this, and some don't. So it's something else to look for when you're evaluating the variant callers. And then there's a third case we can come across where, again, with a complex variant, we found that it can sometimes matter how the aligner aligns it, and it's kind of random and by chance. So in this case, um, there's a deletion of the sequences in the box, and, in, and it's a change to an A. This is the same sample run on the same panel, but the top was processed by, or was run rather, on the MySeq, and the bottom was run on the NextSeq. And is that the reason that they're, they're aligned differently? I'm not entirely sure. It just happens. It could have been entirely random chance, although I think it's more likely to happen on the next seek because when you run things on the next seek or other sequencers that have multiple lanes, the sample is split across the lanes. And in this case, I processed, we processed each individual lane, and only one lane has the alignment that's at the bottom. But it was processed multiple times. It never changes. It's always the same, and somehow it overwhelms the other, and it becomes this. So, it, okay, why does it matter? They both end up being the same sequence, actually the same change if you, if you pay attention to it. But in the case of the, um, the bottom panel, the caller that we primarily use won't call the, well, it can't call two bases at one position, and the deletion will be called at the same position as the SNP. So we only end up with a SNP. So I'll briefly talk about electronic medical records and how this is related to NGS data in the clinical labs. They have a standard format for sharing and integrating um, data across clinical systems, and it's called HL7, Health Level 7. It's been used for 20 years. It's not an encrypted. It's just really plain text. You can see this little panel I have at the bottom is literally what the message looks like. It has a really complex structure, so I kind of color-coded it by sections. Um, each one starts with a three-letter uh, three letters, so MSH, you'll see PID, PVI, ORC, OBR, OBX. And they all, each section then has multiple uh, fields that you can put different pieces of information in that are very highly well-defined. So if it's in, um, for example, uh, PID5, it's their full name. So that's Mr. John Doe. If you count across, that's PID5. And so on for all of those different fields. So this is a snippet of the manual for this system where, or this method, this uh, standard, that shows you what information you can put into the OBX segment. And this is like the result section. So you, if you look it over, you will notice things like uh, PDF, image, JPEG. Um, so you can put files that are of that nature into the system and it will transmit them back into the clinical um, EMR. Um, but really, there's not a whole lot of else that you can put in there. You can put a value, a certain specific number for a test. If you get a, a blood test back with a, with a level of whatever it is they measured in your blood, you could put that result back into the system. But there's not really much space for NGS result here. So, you know, even just one individual's genetic data is really large and complex and a lot, needs a lot of curation, right? So there's a new standard emerging, which is called FIRE, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. And it's a specification that's been in, started in use since 2014. And it's supposed to help with this uh, problem. So this is a bit of an example. You can see that there's a sequence, and it can be broken down into parts. And basically, there's uh, about you know, four different ways that you can reference back to that sequence. You can reference to the RefSeq. Um, you can reference to the change, you can, you know, there's different methods that they have to sort of take snippets of the genetic information from one of these tests and encapsulate that into a message that can be put into an EMR. It's still missing uh, quite a lot. You can't capture the whole VCF file, you can't capture a whole BAM. And I think um, you'll, you'll know, notice, or if you do any reading or if you've worked with this data already, then you'll see that you probably already had to reprocess files. Things are changing very quickly. You don't really want to just um, necessarily permanently record one snippet from somebody's uh, NGS result as being the permanent file. What if we want to go back and we have a new method, a new way to filter out noise from the sequencing data later? We might want to go back and reassess that file. How would we do it if this was all that we had in the electronic record? Uh, the idea is that, you know, probably want to 
at least eventually, um, attach the entire NGS result to somebody's EMR. But how do you do that? That is an unanswered question. And here's really what demonstrates the problem. This is showing the amount of uh, the growth of DNA sequencing um, over, you know, from 2000 when things first started and its projection of what's going to be happening by 2025. I think we've all seen similar figures before. And yeah, it's, it's, it also, um, although if you plotted the use of NGS sequencing in clinical labs with clinical tests, it wouldn't be the same numbers on your axes it would probably be following a very similar traje trajectory. And so that's what we have to think about when we're talking in the clinic. Um, and the projected growth of genomics data is going to be up to uh, one zeta, zeta bases per year. I mean, that's, uh, what is a zeta base? It's about one to the negative, one to the rather, not negative, uh, 21 or something. Okay, so we're, we're talking a huge, huge number. And um, in terms of the amount of storage that's going to be required, 20 to 40, that's exabases per year, exabytes rather, per year. And again, I think that's 1 to the 18 or something. It's, it's an outrageous number, right? Um, so we're, we're going to have a problem. This is what we have to, you know, think in the future. How are we going to mm, capture this data and, one, link it to EMRs? But even more than that, how are we going to manage the data in the first place? Already, when we talk about clinical labs, we have to store the data and archive it for how many years? That's an unknown. And how can you go and retrieve a particular patient record if they want to go back and look at something else again? So one method that is being um, thought about to partially solve part of this problem of just dealing with the data itself is something called object storage. So this is where instead of a traditional file structure where you would normally open windows and you look at the explorer and you can see the hierarchy of where your files are all organized, by using something called object storage, it's more like um, a, a database for the metadata of your information. You put a file in, it's all, all, they're, all the files are together, and they have tags that you can then sort of search like a database. I want to find the files that have you know, this identifier, this patient, whatever, and then it will tell you what that, the ID is of your file. So it's not a, a hierarchical structure for the data. Um, this way is much more manageable to be able to retrieve a file um, more easily in a more timely manner. So I'll finish there by saying that it is uh, it's time consuming uh, to uh, translate research tools into the clinical setting. But, um, you know, if you put in the effort, you can get a good payoff with the quality and reproducible results. Um, and, and these things are being used in clinical care more and more, and it's just going to continue that way. So we have to all work really hard to uh, put that effort in up front so that we can have a good result later on. Thank you.